the unlawful thing to do, what I will with my own, is that I am evil because I am good. So the last should be first, and the first last. For many be called, and be chosen. Amen. Okay, and again, we're looking at this parable as a as a prophecy, exactly. Okay, so let's just do a quick rundown. I just want to take a couple minutes, uh, not too long, and just kind of review what we went over. Matthew 20. Parable is about what? Vineyard of God. A vineyard of the Lord. The purpose of the vineyard is? To produce fruit. Right. Now, the vineyard itself represents who or what? People. People. Uh -huh. Right. Individually or corporately? Corporately, right, as a body. What represents the individual, as we saw in Isaiah 5? It's the actual plant, right? Grafting in of the, of the plant. The fruit is supposed to be the fruit of spirit. the spirit, which really, if we bring all the fruit of the spirit together into one, into one mix, what does it really point us to? Jesus. Point us to Jesus Christ and his character. His character. All right, so God's purpose for the vineyard is for his people to become the workers, to become part of the vine in order to produce fruit, which is perfection of character, this restoration from ruin, from sin, from this point of degradation because of sin, and he wants to restore us back to where we were, and not just back to where we were, but victory, but higher. Sin. Right, because now what do we have for all of eternity? Christ's character and also... Who's going to dwell within us? Holy the Holy Spirit. Right. So this is what God wants. He wants a perfected character. He wants victory over sin. He wants a total transformation. And we mentioned that the focus of Matthew 20 is the workers themselves, the identity, their work. And Isaiah 5, it breaks down the foundation of, of this whole idea that the purpose is the production of fruit. Does that make sense? Right. And we mentioned this idea of the day, of the day and the night. What happens during the day in the parable, in the prophecy? Work gets done, right? When night falls, there's no more work. There's even no more no more light. What kind of a darkness is it? It is a spiritual darkness, but literally speaking, if we were out there in this symbolic night, how dark would it be? Uh, to the point where you can't even... Yeah, how far can you see? You can't, yeah, if you were to put your, this is how seriously you have to think of this. Have any of you ever been in a cave? Yeah. And you turned out the lights? Whoa. That's right. You can't not, see nothing. Yeah. Put your hand in front of you. Yeah, but if there's glowworms at the top, it's really yeah. pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the parallel of that would be the star of the night or something. Yeah. Sure. But yeah, it's a darkness where literally you cannot see anywhere. You cannot move whatsoever. And that's what I find interesting. We Remember we mentioned this idea that, look, when darkness falls, the only thing you can do is stand, right? Remain standing. There is no movement anymore. And we touched upon this with the idea of Revelation 6, right? The question at the end of Revelation 6 is, right, who shall be able to stand? And now what the, what's the interesting contrast is, is that in Revelation 6, in that last, uh, that sixth seal, there is a group that is not standing. The 144,000 are standing, but the other group is doing what? Hiding. I'm sorry? Aren't they hiding? Yeah, they're running. They're running for the rocks and to, to hide themselves in the caves and in the dens, etc., etc. But the very fact of them making the movement at the time when it is night proves what? Proves fail. And so they are running to destruction, whereas the 144,000 are standing and anticipation of the Lord's return, right? So the day, what does the day represent? This idea of work being done during the day represents, and the anti-type, what principle or what work that needs to be done? Sorry? we got to speak up because i got this. The gospel going out. Uh-huh. Right, but that work is first and foremost done where? In the church. In the right, it's, it's in the heart. Okay. Exactly. So we mentioned how this idea of the day, of us being grafted into, remember this whole process? Being grafted into the vine, acquiring the light, the process of photosynthesis, which then strengthens the plant and the world around it, so that it may produce fruit. All of this 
is supposed to take place during the day. So the day represents time when the Holy Spirit is available, when God's word can be found and understood, in order that the man of God may be changed and transformed. When the day is over, when night falls, the Holy Spirit leaves. There is no more acquiring of light. Probation has closed just like the time of Noah, right? The door of mercy closes and there is no more. Process of character transformation. And last week we finished up with all of the workers except for <coughs> except for the eleventh hour workers, right? We don't really know where they are. So um, the first light workers, what can you guys tell me about them really quickly? A couple things. First? Uh huh, the first light of workers. First they were eager to get the work. Sorry? They were eager to get the work. They were eager? Okay. What else? They worked good until until they had competition. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the beginning it was good. They even went as far as to make a contract. They made a covenant, right? So we were looking for a group of God's people who are entering upon the scene, who are raised up corporately at the time when what enters the world? Light. Light. Representing? Truth. Truth. And especially it is God's written word. When it makes its entrance into the world, this group of people is raised up. They are called into the vineyard. They make a contract or a covenant with the owner. And we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that this represents who? Ancient Israel. <coughs> But what what happened to them? They got they got jealous. They got other people came on the scene. They well, they got jealous at the very end, right? But before they got jealous, they got sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, complacency. They sat around instead of doing the work of being a witness and being transformed and corporately producing the fruit because they had good ones. They had a Daniel, they had David's, they had this and this. But corporately, this work was not done. It became self satisfied, Pharisees and kept, uh, crept in. And as a result, by 34 AD, we see that as a body, they reject this gospel message. And they even crucified and destroyed the very one who gave them this truth. Our next set of workers was the third hour workers. What do we know about those guys? Penny. In relation to time, compared to the first light workers, apparently this group has to come when? After. after. Alright, so we're looking for a group of God's people after ancient Israel. There's an advertisement on now, like a body in motion stays in motion. A body that still stays still or something it's a crazy yeah. thing but when you like sometimes in the day I feel like I don't feel like doing anything so I make myself start moving mm -hmm. and then the first thing you know I get a little ambition that's right so yeah, you got to put for that after so they were standing around so they probably just felt like staying there set a goal now, they, and we mentioned this, they could have been standing idle because they didn't want to work, but the very idea that they were in the marketplace may also indicate the opposite, right? The fact that, look, it's early in the morning, I got up early in the morning to go look for work. I'm here in the marketplace, but perhaps nobody hired me. Um, so again, that's personally where I take this idea that the standing idle in the marketplace does not represent your unwillingness to work, but your willingness to work is just nobody wants you. They don't think that you are qualified, capable, right, or skilled, all of those things, externally to the external eye. That's why you mentioned that this represents the apostolic church, right. Comes on the scene immediately right after. Mm -hmm. Right, at the stoning of Stephen. That's when the gospel goes to all the world. What happened with this group? Because remember, the purpose for each group is to do what? Produce fruit. Produce fruit. Transformation of character. Were they successful? In the beginning, was it, does it look like it was going great? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The world was energized with the gospel. What had happened over time? Compromise. Mm -hmm. Compromise with? As especially with paganism, right, where a false system of worship was driven into Christianity. 
And this unholy mix, unfortunately, resulted in a period that we know as the Dark Ages. Is that right? compromise? Is that what they did? I believe so. I believe Satan used a variety of means, but yes. Okay, the next hour, next hour was six and ninth hour. Can actually someone read that verse for us? Matthew twenty and verse five. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. Okay. So again we have a group that is in close connection. And again, uh, we, one thing we didn't mention is that with each group of these workers, what does the owner do with them? What does he give to them? Instructions. Instructions, right, which represents new life. The new life for ancient Israel was? Or what was the foundation of it all? It was the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. The sanctuary, which then contained the Ten Commandments within the Ark of the Covenant. But the foundation, again, is the sanctuary and especially the land that is to come. The apostles, they, their message was the land that had come has now gone to heaven. He's become your high priest to minister in your behalf. The sixth hour and the ninth hour workers we saw are closely related together. And when do they have to appear on the scene? After? Christ. Sometime after the early church had apostatized. Now we know that didn't happen, that didn't fully um, take place at least for a couple hundred years. And then that process continued getting worse and worse. And we mentioned that why could not the sixth hour workers be the church of the reformers, or the reformed church at the time of Martin Luther and the others? What does each new group arrive on the scene with? New light. new light, right, because why? Why the new light? We have to understand the why. Why is he, why is he giving them a light in the first place? Light going out. I'm sorry? Re-energize them. Re-energize them. In relation to the vineyard, why would you need instructions? I haven't worked here before. Mm -hmm. Right, perhaps you hadn't worked there. Perhaps you don't know how to. The instructions are designed to help you perform the job in the way that you're supposed to do it. Okay, but here's the question. If a set of instruction was given to ancient Israel, to that first group of workers, why can't the previous group use that same exact instructions? I mean, because technically... It wasn't, given, it wasn't directly given to them. So a worker would have to get, then give you some of them, and it might not be quite correct. Okay, let, let me let me put it this way. Let's say the owner does this. Right? He comes over on the message board. A set of instructions. Therefore, from this point forward, any set of any new group of workers that comes in looks at the instructions, okay, get to work. Why can't each consecutive group use that same set of instructions? Couldn't understand it. It's not for their time. They couldn't understand it, it's not for their time. Uh, I, I don't Day. It's later on in the day, so what those people did, you don't have to do. Now different it's like work. such slightly different work. Yeah. But I thought that the work is still the work in the vineyard of production of fruit, regardless of the group of work. The idea is the same, but the, the actual job might change because if the first group did this part, you don't have to redo it again. You have to do this. See what I, I mean? Go on. I, I like that thought, although. In, in practice, we know that all of us start at that same point. We all start, you know, when we enter that walk with Christ, we all start at the zero. You've got to work your way up when it comes to character transformation. So I like the thought. But Michelle, you mentioned a word, time. What about time? It's time. Remember, the question is, why can't each group use that once the original set of instructions that was first nailed on the wall? Because it was for their time period that they were alive in, and more truth comes out, so more instructions are mm -hmm. put forth. Okay, so we understand that as time progresses, God reveals more light. But again, the question is, why? Because they're growing. They're supposed to be growing, Jerry? Well, the other thing is, too, there were, like in the sixth hour time, there was an uh, introduction of things that had to be corrected. Mm -hmm. So there was a different, 
different model anymore that they had the puddles and still rely on the original ideas, mm -hmm. but they had to adjust for some of the other things that are coming. Let's try to correct them also. Okay, good thought, Butch. What are we doing in the district? Are we harvesting the grapes? Or are we growing the grapes to harvest? Mm -hmm. That's the paradox. We're doing both. Because we're coming there to pick. The first group had to pick of the litter. It was easy picking. The later we get in the day, the harder it is to find good grapes because they've been picked over. They're few and far between. It's much more difficult. So therefore, we need either direction, light, something to find the good grapes that are left. Okay. Good point. That is a good point. See, what I'm thinking is, again, think of what does the owner have to get done in that 12-hour day? <coughs> he has to produce a vineyard full of good. perfect fruit. Not just good, but perfect, completely perfect fruit. So maybe we're not even picking grapes in this <laughs> Yeah, see, I don't think that the picking of the grapes happens until the, the owner comes back. You know, translate as we're the dressing come. Right. But, but the way I understand it, or the way the way I, I like to think about it is there's twelve hours to work in a day. With each consecutive group, when they come on the scene, spend three hours, okay, they got corrupted, we need a new group. Again, what had just passed? How many hours? Three hours, then another three hours. So the reason why the instructions have to be enhanced or built upon or added on to yeah, because you're running out of time. Now you have to do more work or that same amount of work in less amount of time, meaning that you have to be more focused, you have to be more concentrated, you have to put more effort, more zeal to make sure that this fruit gets produced, which then really takes us to you know the, the perplexity of that last group because they have to do 12 hours work in and an hour's time. They need a foreman because the first pickers might pick up to there by the time the next ones come. But you've got to allow a little more time because they're tired, and so they have to move up, and then you have to realize they're going to finish the day, and these are going to finish the day. So each one's going to be shorter, and these will be the last ones will be more enthusiastic, and these other ones will be dragging by that time. So right. you have to kind of estimate where they're going to be, and then the I would think the foreman would say, "You better start here because these guys still have to." And you just got these ones better start here. So you have to have some sort of a knowledge or judgment of how fast everything's going. Exactly, in order to adjust. And we see that exemplified with that what you just mentioned with the, the first laborers becoming wary. You know, perhaps it was the sun and everything. But that's exactly what they say, right? They say that look, you know, how come you're giving these guys so much when we endured the sun? You know, we got all sleepy and tired and everything. We didn't perhaps we didn't get a chance to eat. So it's, uh, it's an interesting thought. But again, the purpose here is there is less time, and so more in the instructions needed. Think of it kind of like a shortcut. You need to do this. This way it will be faster, more efficient. Do it this way. Boom, boom, boom. And that way this work can get done in a timely manner. The sixth and ninth hour of work. So again, we mentioned, we, we kind of got onto this topic, why couldn't it be the reformers? For the six hour workers? Because each group comes on the scene with? With new light. Right. Was there any new light which had not previously been known by the early church before? No, there wasn't. Everything had been known. It just been resurfaced, uncovered. That rubbish of tradition, all that paganism, the abominable practices were swept away. And look, truth was exalted because it was so pure. And so we mentioned this idea that the six hour workers, there was no revelation of the new light until we get to that great awakening movement of the 1830s and 40s that we'll study in Revelation chapter 10. But what did they do? This group, the six hour workers. Yeah, they misread the instructions. The instructions were focused on the book of Daniel. The 2300 day prophecy, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, look, there is going to be something happening in relation to this sanctuary work, but unfortunately, they misunderstood a part of it. And so, as a result, very quickly, God had to start from scratch. Because, look, if you get the instructions wrong, well, fruit is not going to be produced anyways. 
So who comes on the scene shortly thereafter? Right, in 1844, there was a, right, it was called the Millerite Movement, and it culminated in the Great great Disappointment. Again, we'll study all of this in Revelation 10. But there was only three hours left to work in the vineyard. The Lord says, look, one more group, they can do this. And so a group of God's people, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, all people from these different denominations came together. God gave them all these beautiful truths. What was their purpose? What was God's purpose for this group? Uh, to produce fruit, but also to what were they supposed to present to the world? The three angels' messages, right? That last message of mercy and warning that we find in Revelation 14. Your God, give glory to him. Babylon is fallen. Don't accept the mark of the beast, in short. So it was God's purpose to now raise up a people. Well, look, we're at the very end. They're going to produce fruit. They'll give out this loud cry. The work will be finished. Boom, my vineyard's going to be ready. And of course, that's what their instructions were, so the three angels' messages, as we'll study them in Revelation 14. Now, so far in history, has this happened the way that the Lord wanted it to happen? Not quite. Right? We're going to come back to this. We'll, we'll go back to, to 1888 at another time and what happened in that year. But again, we see that over time, when it's happened to the message that was given to us, that we're not sitting on. We actually think that we're preaching it, but the message has been so diluted to the point where we think that this is going forth with great power, where in reality we're lacking the, and denying the power of godliness thereof. Unfortunately. So we are compromising with sin, with Babel, and we are following the world. And this is what breaks us, or really takes us to another group, right? Because what do we read right after? Can someone read for us Matthew 20 and verses 6 and 7, please? About the eleventh hour went out, and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go, ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Okay. All right, so the eleventh hour workers. What can you tell me about these guys? Seems, seems they wanted to do. Seems they wanted to do, but somebody told us about Mm -hmm. Okay. There's clear indication so there's that there's some there's some sense of eagerness there, but no direction. Right. right. Okay. What else? First and foremost, why are they needed? Obviously, there's work to be done. Uh huh. Right. They are needed because what did the ninth hour workers? What are they doing? It's not what they had done, but what are they doing? Present wheels, they're not getting anywhere. Needed because the ninth hour workers, and again, notice the present tense, are not producing a <coughs> uh, perfect proof. So they are needed because the ninth hour workers are not producing perfect proof. But this is where you have to be very careful because if you're wrong, you can go off, you know, on the on a very dangerous extreme. Um, one main thing about this group is when do they appear? Sometime after 1844. Right. We know obviously it's the eleventh hour, but we know so far that each group thus far has been given how much time? Three hours. Three hours. This group appears at the 11th hour, which comes when? It's within those three hours given to who? The to the ninth hour workers, right. So first, and we have to be very careful, careful on this, they appear, um, they appear on the scene. During the 3 
three hours. About it to the ninth hour work. We have been called to spread the three angels' messages to the world with great power, which has not happened because us falling into apostasy, unfortunately. And if there is a group that appears on the scene, is called onto the scene, the Lord is looking down into this vineyard. He is looking down at the eleventh hour. Look, at the ninth hour, I called this super zealous group of workers. They were doing such a great work. I thought they were going to get things done. But the Lord is looking down at the exact the eleventh hour, and what does He see? There's an hour left. Mm -hmm. Nothing's happening. Maybe he doesn't want to take a chance. Yeah, he cannot chance it. it at this point. He has to make sure destiny of the universe weighs on this, whether fruit gets produced or not. But this tells you that this group of workers that is called within these three hours, this is not a new what? Yeah, this is not a new structure of God's people. This group comes within the three hours allotted to the message that is supposed to be preached <laughs> by the Advent people, by the seventy hours people. So this is not a new organization. It's not a call to you know break off from the body and join you know shepherd's rod or, or this or that the 70, 70 Adventist reform movement. This is not a new organization. And if they appear within those three hours, what else can you tell me? And we kind of have to tie in reality here. There's not a new organization. Well, there's these are a group of people that are, that are finally getting it. I mean, they're, they're understanding everything has to be surrendered. Everything has to be done now. Mm -hmm. We don't have any time left. The right. world, world's in a train wreck, and we've got to uh, let the people know this is what God is expecting from us. Right, so they understand. They understand that how how short is time. You know, they understand that look, we are entering the eleventh hour. They understand um, that they are the last group of workers. Meaning, if they are standing in an idle place, can they see the sun starting to get lower and lower and lower? So they understand the time that they are living in, but they are still in the marketplace. What I was trying to point to here is another fact that is revealed by the very thing that the 11th hour workers come within the three hours allotted to this group that's supposed to preach the three angels' messages tells us what about the message? Of this group. It's true. Sorry? It's true. It's true. It's yeah, it's based on the message that was given to the ninth hour workers. Because the eleventh hour workers comes within that three hours. Each three hours really represents new light being given. Boom, 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 one after another. The eleventh hour comes within that three hours given to the ninth hour, which tells you that the message that the eleventh hour workers are going to present is first and foremost based on the message given to whom? To the ninth hour workers. Does that kind of make sense? So let me see here. Um, so no new instructions. I'm yeah, to, hurry it up. <laughs> yeah, hurry yeah, up. basically. We're not going to get the job done. The true mystery of the three hours allotted to the ninth hour workers. It is not a new organization. I would say that these manifest I don't want to twist it the wrong way. These manifest from among 
those who are, are they willing to give the message? Well, that the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. Effectively, yep. Yeah. Revelation 18 4. I'm sorry, what did you say, Jay? Revelation 18 4. Right? It's, a, it's the re emphasis on the second angel's message. Mm -hmm. And getting down, it's, it's, it's uh, naming names and, and putting the. The facts out there so people can see who's who. That's right. So the instructions, first and foremost, are based on the message that was given to the ninth hour workers, which is Revelation 14. There's the three angels' messages, the final message to the world. However, is that all that there is to their message? Because so I would like us really quick, I want to just point something out I think is very important. Let's go to Revelation 14 really quick. I just want to do a quick read through the three angels' messages, and then I want to look at another portion of Revelation and compare it in light of the instructions for the 11th hour workers. Revelation 14. And can someone read for us Revelation 14 and verses 6 and 7, please? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Hear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains and waters. Okay, second angel's message. Can someone grab verse 8, please? And I followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. Okay, and the third one, I'm not going to read it, but it's the warning against the mark of the beast. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 8. Look at where it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Is there any more to this message revealed in this chapter? Is there any more details about Babylon being fallen and whatnot? Yes, no? No, not that there, there's no clear verbatim, you know, thus say the Lord, this is about the second angel's message. And the reason why I bring this up is because, remember how we covered this idea when we went to Matthew 27? This idea how there is a beautiful type and anti-type. And the sequence of events pertaining to Jesus' final hours. When we looked at Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, I think it's verses 45 through 47, this idea that when Jesus was on the cross, he was crucified, there was darkness from the sixth to the ninth hour, and we saw how the sequence of events from the time that Jesus was put on the cross up until his resurrection and his entrance to the holy city, that sequence of events, in principle, is a great parallel to the experience of God's people at the very end of time. Right? We have the same thing. There is a sixth and ninth hour tied in together. Compared to the ninth hour, there is darkness upon the earth um, at the sixth hour. We saw that at the ninth hour, what does Jesus do? And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. There is a loud cry with a loud warning that has a parallel at the very end. In 1844, when that message was first given, some time passes in the account, Jesus gives out another loud cry, and then he gives up the ghost. But the whole thing is, an ex or is a peril, is a prophecy of what's going to happen at the end of time. The message is first preached. However, it fails to reach a crescendo, you could say, that it's supposed to get. Therefore, it is given again, 
as soon as it is given, what happened with Jesus? He gave up the ghost. His ministry finished. There is some kind of a depth. The spirit is withdrawn. Jesus has finished his work. It's the same thing at the end of time. Once that loud cry is given, that, that final time, Jesus' ministry is done. The spirit is withdrawn. And the 144,000 go through a kind of a death experience that we'll study in Revelation 11. Afterwards, there is a what? A resurrection from the grave and eventually entrance into the holy city, which is exactly the same thing that's going to happen at the very end. Sequence of events from start to finish. Bam. Beautiful parallel right there. And the reason why I mention this is because you know how there we mentioned that there are two loud cries in a matter of speaking. First, the message is given to the Advent people in 1844. They're supposed to accept the message, allow it to transform them, to live a holy life, so that the message goes out with power. They fail to do this, now the loud cry is going to be given again. Follow me? When we get to Revelation 18, this loud cry being repeated is stated there verbatim. And I want you to look at the difference between Revelation 14 and verse 8, the amount of information between that verse and what we read about being uh, about Babylon being fallen in Revelation 18. Look at Revelation 18 and verses. Actually, can we have maybe two people? We want. We're going to read verses one through ten. And and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth were waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled to her double, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much tor torment and sorrow give her, for she setteth in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am and, and no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plates come in one day, death, mourning, and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament, lament for her when they lament, when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon. That mighty city, for one hour is thy judgment come. Okay, so did you notice a bit of a contrast between Revelation 14 and verse 8 and here? What did you see? Details. It's what? A lot of details. A lot more detail, mm -hmm. right. Back there, it's just Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and it's bad. That's really what it says. Get away from it. Here, and we only read just the first half of the chapter. You go on for the next six verses, talks about how Babylon has poisoned the, the merchants and the, the commerce of the world through its riches and its uh, delicacies and everything. And then there is the great judgment pronounced again upon, upon Babylon itself. But what is the reason why I bring this out is that this idea of the loud cry being repeated, we see here that when it is, it is repeated at the very end by, this, by these 11th hour workers, it is with much more what? Detail and with power. What is the detail about? 
from Revelation 18. Well, it's, it's revealing the things that are leading people astray. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's um, giving people a clearer picture of what they have to fear and how to mm -hmm. how to avoid it. Right. It exposes the system to be a system of deception and calls people from that work of iniquity to righteousness, right? But you're effectively right. We see that the message that's going to be given is, in effect, the message that exposes the system itself for what it is. It's really what it says, the great details. It's going to include everything that the system has been doing, how it has crept into the powers of economy, of church, of state, of politics, and all of this. What has been creeping into the churches, everything is going to be uncovered in order, as Jerry said, to give the people the best possible bit of information so that they can make the right decision. That's really why this is happening. That's how I wrote that. This message here is enhanced to what we see in Revelation 18. It's the three angels messages really multiplied by a thousand. Did anyone notice something in verse 10 of Revelation 18? One hour. Dave, can you say that again? One hour. One hour. Is the judgment come? Mm -hmm. There's a mention of one hour as when the judgment comes upon Babylon. Does that think that's there by coincidence? No. Good enough for Josiah. That's right. <laughs> How much time do the 11th hour workers have? One hour. One hour. We're going to come back to this idea, but you'll see here, and if you want to go down maybe to verse um, 17, 17 through 19, can someone read that, please? For in one hour so great riches is it come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood far off and cried. And they saw the smoke of the burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Oh. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all the ships to see by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is the day desolate. Don't you think that's there by accident? It's there for a purpose. To lead us back to Matthew 20 and this work that's supposed to be done at the 11th hour. And I don't want to try to, if you don't remember this very well, then don't worry about it. But if you remember uh, what we studied in Daniel with the image and with the stone, I remember how Satan, in order to achieve victory, Satan has to use who? Sorry? People. He has to use people, right. To establish and to accomplish his means, he has to use people. This, it's the means, the medium through which he works. God, in order to achieve victory within his battle between good and evil, also has to use people to do this. And so there's a subtle hint to this idea how it is the work of the, the 144,000 at the 11th hour, their work of shining, of reflecting the character of Christ fully, of exposing evil in Babylon and this, this worldwide system of false worship that has been set up. It is that work of righteousness that they do at the 11th hour that literally undoes everything that Satan has been doing. It's interesting in light of the current events, um, mm -hmm. some of this stuff. Um, if all of this is exposed, it's not going to come through CNN mm -hmm. or NBC or anybody else. That's right. It's going to be coming through God's people who are standing for the truth mm -hmm. and aren't afraid to tell what the truth is. That's right. Yeah, just as we saw with which group of workers? The third hour, right? Simple, humble men and women. So if there is one thing that you're going to remember out of the study tonight, is this. I don't know, it just popped into my head, and I like it. Um, that at the 11th hour, it's simple, but I don't know if it's catching. 
At the eleventh hour, the gospel, what? The gospel shall be given with great power. Easy to remember, right? At the eleventh hour, the gospel shall be given with great power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to produce, <laughs> to help finish up the food, right? Make sure. Okay. Now we touched upon this idea. The owner needs the workers to do what? Produce fruit. Okay. These guys produce fruit. For the sake of argument, we're going to have to figure out, this is just, just assume that I'm telling you that this is what happens. But we're going to have to look at the Bible and see whether the Bible says that this is true. But this group, this group of workers, the 11th hour, is the only group to do what? To produce what kind of fruit? Perfect. But how? Individually or corporate, right? As a body. Not just one or two or three or ten grapes but 144,000 grapes. This group is the only one to produce perfect fruit. They're all the Enoch's. <laughs> right. Yeah, Enoch's and Jesus. Or Elijah, Elijah right? Yeah. Enoch's and Elijah's. Why do we say that? You didn't see death. You never right, because both of them were translated without seeing death, and that's exactly what the 144,000 will go through. These are Enoch's and Elijah's, which means that they have perfected characters and victory over. Right, victory over sin. Now we know that they are there at the eleventh hour. How long do they work? For one hour until nightfall. So we'll say that they continue in the vineyard. Now, they remain in the vineyard until not just nightfall, but a, uh, until the owner returns. Now, it's, it's, we already understand that once nightfall comes, even though these workers are still in the vineyard, what are they no longer doing? Yeah, they're no longer working. They're only standing. Okay, so think of it as like, you know, that, that grape that has been perfected. That grape is now just calmly waiting there for the owner to come and pick it and eat it. So they continue in the vineyard until the owner returns. So what does that mean? Well, they're accepted. They survive through how much of the end time events? Everything. All of them, because they are alive through to the return of the owner. The owner, right. Now, and don't take that too far because, you know, I know you can argue that, well, you know, technically, from a parable standpoint, you know, the, the ones that were there in the first light and third hour were still there. We're kind of taking a, a slightly more, I don't know how to put it, more broad look at this, this as a prophetic, you know, so you can't literally take everything, every single little detail verbatim. But again, they continue in the vineyard until the owner returns. Pointing to the fact that they survived through it all without what? Mm -hmm. Without seeing that. So exactly. You've already, you already clarified on your proof that they had had the instruction, but they they failed. 
and so they they separated themselves. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you wouldn't have to worry about that being too much of a problem here because they they didn't stay in line. And once they separated themselves from the plan, right. then they're not included. That's interesting. Let me um. Are you guys back in Matthew 20 or no? If you're if you're not there, please go back to Matthew 20. Let me just take a look at something. Really quick. Matthew 20. I just want to take a look at something. I was I was just brainstorming the possibility because you know in Isaiah 5, what the Lord says to that first vineyard that represented Israel. When they apostatized, what did he say that he was going to do with that particular vineyard? Tear it down. Yeah. Well, it's not that he was going to tear it down. He was going to take the hedge away from it, the protection, and allow all the beasts and all the animals to come in and destroy it. Which implies the idea that in order for, if he's going to call another set of workers, at this point, what does he have to do? Does he have a vineyard at this point? No. No, because he just, that one wanted nothing to do with him, so he left it. So now it's it's kind of an implication that each time a new group of workers is called, he reestablishes the vineyard afresh. He builds a fresh vineyard. Um, but that's that's an idea I haven't, you know, I haven't really thought about it too much. I just kind of, you know, popped in the head. Oh, that would solve that conundrum, you know, right there. Okay, so they survive through it all without seeing death. Okay. Where are they found? In the beginning. Why were they there? No man hath eyed us. Now, I want, you to ask, I want to ask you this. Is there any indication that, that these guys are lazy or, uh, lazy, or is there any indication that these guys are eager to work? Is there any evidence for one or the other? Yeah. I think they're eager they to show work them. because people, if they were looking to take like, day workers in the old days that would go to the cities and look for work, if they didn't find something by noon, they'd leave, they'd settle there, whatever. Yeah. The fact that they're still right. waiting there and it's only an hour or less since they're dying on us. Absolutely. And it looks like they tried to get a job because no man has hired us. Yeah, and they did apply. And and you know, from a human perspective, Pam, to, to stand there all the way up until five PM when it's about to sun's about to set in an hour seems you know, it's a ridiculous idea. Well look, there's things you could be doing, man. You know, be being productive instead of standing there for eleven hours. So no man has hired us. Um, so let's see. They weren't hired by anyone, but they were what? They were eager, eager to work. They remained. They remained in the marketplace. All day. Looking for what? I keep seeing the Holy Spirit being motivated. I'm sorry, Jerry, can you speak up? I, I keep seeing the Holy Spirit being the motivator. Like, they're there and, and the Holy Spirit's got somebody to go. You're just waiting for the time to flip the switch. Well, he has to be, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that fire can only be lit up by the Holy Spirit. You know, so these guys, and just keep that in mind, these guys have that fire burning in their hearts, which should take you to another parable that we're going to take a look at concerning the 144,000, which is a fire burning somewhere. Matthew, still in the book of Matthew. There's lamps in there too. You know? Ah, okay, right. The parable of the ten virgins. Because we're going to look at it in a way that even we as Adventists uh, don't normally look. We normally look at the focus. Well, look, the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Which group do you guys want to be a part of? The wise, usually, right? We're going to study that the answer to that question is 
The question is, do you want to be a part of the wise or the foolish? The question for a Christian should be, yeah, neither. Neither. Because there is another party in that parable that is not mentioned verbatim, but is super important. And the question is, I just, I don't know, I just felt like mentioning this. If you've never thought about this, think about this in Matthew 25. Who awakens the virgins? Uh -huh. We're going to jump into that uh, maybe next week. We're going to be tying all of this, and all these ideas are going to be coming together. Now, do you guys see a similarity, a little bit at least, between the 11th hour workers and the 3rd hour? The 3rd hour, we're also where? In the marketplace, right. It's the same idea, that externally, these guys, they appear to have. Unskilled, right? They didn't have all these qualities that we already mentioned before. They were unskilled, untrained, um, well, not supposed to say unqualified. So all outward appearance looks like these guys can't get the work done. I know, I think I just heard horrible handwriting over there. No, no, no. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I can, you know, that kind of criticism I can accept. The last word of um, no, this one? Yeah, etc. I try to write too fast. That's all. Yeah, I mean, the board. So. <laughs> that's true. Okay. So it's the same thing. As with the third hour workers, Tell me some of the people that God used in the third hour that were instrumental in bringing the gospel to the forefront. Uh -huh. Who were the apostles? Before, before Paul came on the scene, were any of them learned? There was one, but what did he do? He hanged himself, right? After betraying Jesus. So all of them, yeah, they were fishermen, they were tax collector, laid off. They were simple men and women. And cheating. That's, yeah, that's what the, the Bob director tells us, right? I mean, these guys were cheats, unfortunately, most of the time. So that's what the third hour workers, these are not the ecclesiastical authorities. Mm -hmm. Authorities or leaders, but zealous and simple men and women who I will say who depart from sin completely because of their what? Love for who? Jesus. That's right, because of their love for Christ, and I couldn't really squeeze that. So as with the third hour workers, these are not the ecclesiastical authorities, not the leaders, but zealous, simple men and women and children who depart from sin completely because of their love for Christ. They don't do this to be saved. They do this because Christ is now in their hearts, shining through I love this quote. You guys remember this? Great Controversy, page 606. Actually, can someone read this for me? Lena, can you read someone? The whole thing? Uh, just a paragraph. Okay. First one? It's the third one. Right. Some look with contempt upon those whom the Lord honors. Is that the one from Great Controversy 606? Um, GC 606? <laughs> okay. Sorry. Holy Spirit qualifies. Thus the message of the third angel will be proclaimed. As the time comes for it to be given the greatest power, the Lord will work through humble instruments, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the 
unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with the holy seal, declaring the word the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard the words like these. So essentially, what we're going to see happen with the 11th hour is Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, magnified a thousandfold, which we can't even fathom yet. We really can't. Well, but I can see, I mean, we're right on the TikTok clock with that one. It's just, it can happen overnight. That's right. If, if that was the, the time clock of Matthew 20, what would it say right now? 1159. Well, or, well, 11.59 or 10.59. Mm. Remember, these guys, have an hour yet. we haven't become them yet. Put it that way. But it's it needs to happen. It must, must happen. Can I turn, by the way? What's that last thing? That uh, be, be, be. Because of their love for Christ. Yeah, I just ran out of one Sorry. Okay. Okay, so again, one more time. Why are they so special? In light of this vineyard. We produce perfect fruit. All right, they... How fast do they produce it? In one hour. That's right, they do 12 hours work in one hour's time. That's something. You can find a worker like that. I heard. What's your Michelle? You super happy. Yeah. And then me, a woman that works so hard. That's right. More time for the Bible and for the Lord. They do 12 hours work in one hour's time. Now, as time goes on, and think about it this one, I guess kind of apply it a little bit more practically. As time goes on with each set of workers, what are the conditions of the, I guess, the land around them, the world around them? Just for example, when the first light workers are raised up, what was the state of the world as far as morality or, or distractions? They had no direction. Anything went. Okay. What happened with Tom as Tom progressed? What does Satan do? Right, he continues to attack the church, but he uses the old tactics and invents new ones as he goes along. Right, so he seeks to attack the church. Any which way? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah, the original, some are, were just flat out frontal attacks. Mm -hmm. And then later, he got more deceptive by God getting inside the organization and corrupting from the inside out. That's right. So the deception, deception increases with time. The amount of distractions, and think about the world we are living in today. I mean, with the media, with the music, there are all sorts of you know carnal pursuits. Um, whatever your vice, you can find it. You know, so if you really think about it, compared to the first life workers, these guys didn't have all the TVs and everything. You know, they work, but they were distracted by all this garbage. They could sit down, grab the tour, and start reading. This is why Paul, even Paul was able to, I don't want to give us an excuse not to, but this is why Paul, you know, before he was 18, he had the first five books of the Bible memorized verbatim. But with us, with our poisoned minds and the stuff that we intake, that we breathe, and we poison ourselves with, you know, what kind of a condition of the world that we're living in compared to the old guys? So think about now the fact that, look, you don't have 12 hours in which to work. You only have one hour. But now the condition around the vineyard, imagine now the vineyard is in a desert. There is no rain. There is dust and sandstorms all the time. There's wild beasts trying to get in. 
prior when the Lord established the vineyard the first time it was on a nice little valley with trees and you know and greenery around it. No, this time it's in a desert where that fruit has to be produced. I mean, and again, think about glory to the, the owner if you can pull this off. The 12 hours work and the one hour's time. But the reason they are so special is because they produce this fruit, not only because it is done so quickly, but they produce fruit among some of the most perplexing, challenging, and discouraging conditions ever experienced by human beings. You made the point about, you know, if you find any advice you want, mm-hmm. and it's sanctioned as being mm-hmm. acceptable. And, you know, that's, what, right. that's Satan's playing to the carnal nature. Mm-hmm. And when folks get hooked down, whether it's food or drugs or whatever else they get into, that is so entrenched in them mm-hmm. that they just can't come loose from it. Yeah, it's, it's supernatural, really, in nature. That's and when Satan's to, allowed to work. To bring this to people and say, there's a better way. And you got to do it with a way without you know, putting a gun at their head and saying, mm-hmm. you better do it or else. Yeah. you got to make it very attractive and, and you know, give them the, the benefits afterwards of being on the holy city on golden streets. And the only way to do that is with who? Through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, through the Holy Spirit. So we, we, we simply do not know how to do it in and of ourselves. Um, are you guys still in Matthew 20? No. Okay. Let's really quick read a little bit more here concerning this group. But let's read it concerning the very, very end, after the owner already gives the reward, uh, the payment to his workers. Let's look at Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. Okay. Who is that talking about? But the many, and specifically, the last shall be first, and the first last. The eleventh hour workers, in relation to chronology, when do they appear? At the very end, right. So the 11th hour workers appear on the scene. Uh, I'll just say last. But what happens to them? They first. They first. Mm-hmm. Why? I don't know. To make the other one day, we added on. <laughs> no, the why is right here, right? That's, mm-hmm. That's the why. That's the why. So they appear on the scene last. And again, visually or externally, they seem, if you were to, if you were to get all these five groups of workers to line up right next to each other at that same time, would some perhaps look a little bit more um, capable to perform the work from an external standpoint than others? Perhaps, right? Because this group, externally, really, really how long are they in the marketplace? The 11th hour, right? The previous workers, first light, these guys are ready to go. Let's get this done. 11th hour guys are still waiting. Third hour, this group, okay, they want to work, not too bad. Sixth hour, ninth hour, not bad, not bad. Clearly, these guys keep getting passed on, which tells you that externally, out of all the groups, they seem to be the most incapable out of all of them, seem the most incapable out of all for performing the work. And they're the best paid. 
they got the same amount. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's right. They so got the they, same amount. So for one little time, they got that whole amount that the other people were filled with. And if, we and if we translate this to you know, the anti-type, the parallel in the future concerning the 144,000, I think that God takes this even further. The pay is equal, but there are some privileges that are granted to some, perhaps, uh, rather than others. But let me just write this. Appear on the scene last. They seem the most incapable out of all for performing the work. But God does a lot with them. Use them how? Right. In a mighty way. They seem the most incapable. Incapable in the God's true experience? Or? Incapable as appearing. Not this way. In other words, when people were looking at these guys, when they were going to the marketplace to work, externally they just didn't appear. Perhaps they had clothes that were, you know, ripped. Perhaps, you know, externally. yeah, perhaps externally they didn't take care of themselves. Or they just, you know, I don't know, had some kind of a posture that somebody didn't like, or said this, or just looked funny, or whatever it may be. But from an external standpoint, these guys seem like, look, he doesn't look like a worker. He doesn't look like an office employee. He doesn't look like this. He doesn't look like that. So the kind of people that they were being looking, that they were looking for, externally, they didn't see it in these guys. But what did God see? Their heart. They saw their heart. I have a question. Uh -huh. I have a question about the pay. Because... The first, like the last received what the first received, and like all the ones in the middle, they all received the same. So is it logical to think that the first workers did not do as well as the second, and then the second didn't do as well as the third, and then like towards the end, like people were just doing better and better jobs. That's why they all received the same. The first made the contract saying, this is how much I get paid. But for all the other ones, it says that what is right, I will give you. So obviously they deserve that one penny or whatever right. they got because they obviously did as much work as the first ones even though those were their old day and these people did it in one hour. Make sense? I, yes. I'm, it's a question. Yeah, and it's, and it's another one. Well, I, I like that, but what you just said kind of made me no, go into... That, that's exactly what is written here because the first one's made a contract, but with the other one says, what is right, I will give you. So obviously, what is right, they receive, which is one penny. Right, and, and, I just, and if you take that even farther... We know that that pay is equal, but what will the 144,000, what do we see in Revelation 7? That they are seen, seen where? In the sanctuary. Sorry? In the heavenly sanctuary. They look in uh -huh. And where exactly? They are, yeah, they're sitting on thrones. So they will shall be, so even though these appear on the scene last, they seem the most incapable when it comes to performing the work, but they will be exalted. As first, and as kings and right, kings and priests, the lowest of the low, where we make tall. It's interesting here too, because this this group put to the line mm -hmm. that Satan says no one can keep God's law. They, they demonstrate it perfectly, and that's why. And they, they're the living living proof in the end that God's law is possible. It's written on the heart fully. Yeah. And that's what the, the New Covenant says. The law is written on the heart, which then enables us to do the love works of Christ. And that's what we're going to actually going to look at that when we when we go back to Revelation 7. You know this this whole idea of well, why are the 144,000 split up into 12 different names and 12,000 for each? Uh, we're going to bring that out when we when we get to that. But yeah, absolutely. You know these guys. The reason why are they they are so special is because they show the universe that look, it is possible for man to be restored and to live righteously and live a holy life, perfectly in line with God's principles. It is possible. Even though the world, everything around them tells them that they cannot do it. 
Matthew 20, verse 16. Let me read something to you. Um, this is from 10 Manuscript Releases, page 170. And I quote, at the 11th hour, when the work grows harder and the people are most more hardened, you know, again, these conditions getting worse and worse. As time goes on, the wickedness around the world gets more difficult. There will be a variety of talent brought in. These workers will prove faithful and receive their penny. Sacrificing men will step into the places made vacant by those who would not be fitted for a place in the heavenly temple. These resources will continue to come in. The Lord will provide openings and facilities. He will call upon the youth to fill up the places made vacant by deaths and apostasy. He will give young men and women, as well as those who are older, the cooperation of the heavenly intelligences. They will have converted characters, converted minds, converted hands, converted feet, and converted tongues. Their lips will be touched with a living coal from the divine altar. And if they will learn the lesson of walking humbly before God, if they will not seek to invent new plans, but, do, but will do that which the Lord has appointed them to do, they will be enabled to carry God's plan onward and upward, carrying the work forward to completion. And that's exactly what these guys are called to do. Because essentially what's going to happen is that at the time of Pentecost, was it clear that God was manifesting his power through human beings? Yes. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So again, think of that magnified a hundred times, a thousandfold. What we're going to see is heaven and earth united with the world. And this is what we're going to see if we turn to Romans chapter 9. Can we go there really quick? Romans chapter 9 and verse 28. And if someone could read for us uh, from the King James Version, please, if you have one. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Romans 9, 28. Did you notice something there? That seems to be out of line with our studies here? Apparently, seemingly. For he will finish the work. Right, for he will finish the work. But he has to empower people. We cannot do it on our own. So he does. Mm -hmm. But I thought that what we've just been studying in Matthew shows us that the workers are the ones that are working. Only work together. by the Holy Spirit. Because, well, on, on the other hand, I thought that the owner, he, the owner, had left and did not return until nightfall. But he gave us the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he does, right? He provides the, the light. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm really trying to lead to here is this, he you know... In a, the, the will and the to do of his good pleasure. Oh. Now, but my question is, why does he get the credit? I'm not questioning that. I'm happy that it's so. But for the sake of argument, why does it say that he will finish the work? Because he does. We're he just gave kind of power to do it. Him, we because without him, we couldn't do it. His battle. All of these beautiful answers. I'm just looking at this That's from the perspective of the parable itself. Look at the concept of the vineyard, right? Remember, the purpose here is for the owner to produce in the middle of a desert, apparently at this point, a perfect, beautiful vineyard with 144,000 perfectly ripened grapes. Okay? It's his purpose. He must do this. In order for righteousness to remain in the universe, he has to do this. He has to do this through human beings. They are the ones who are sent into the vineyard to work. They are the ones working in the vineyard, and they also become part of the plan, and they are the ones who produce fruit. The owner in the parable in the vineyard is not there. It's the workers that are doing the work. So why is it that he gets the credit? 
he pays them, so they don't owe him anything. They did his work. They, they got paid, but it's like when you own a business. You have to get this, this, this done. The accountant does their work, the secretaries, whatever, do their stuff. You see what I mean? They get paid, but it's really his business, so it's his. Right, it's, it's the owner that always gets the credit. And I mean, you know, you think about all those, the 135,000 mums that Butch and Michelle have over here. If they grow to perfection, would anyone come to their farm and walk up to every single one, good job, you little mum, good job, and not mention a word to Butch or Michelle? Hey, you think that person is nuts. No, you're going you're gonna to thank and, 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 and glorify, in a matter of speaking, the one who is the owner of this field. The one who has spread his resources to nurture and to establish this field. They'll say that Butch and Michelle produce wonderful fruit on their farm. Exactly, exactly. And that's that's you know kind of looking at it from a different perspective. You know, from a perspective of a vineyard, that's why he gets the credit, not us. The plant doesn't get the credit for continuing to grow. Does that make sense? Okay. This this goes back to uh, earlier kind of a question you asked about how can this 12-hour job get done in one hour because he's going to cut it short in righteousness. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's going to be nice and short, but it's going to be precise and perfect. But that yep. last, I'm just thinking, mm -hmm. that last hour, all of the workers are working during that hour. Well, I mean, it's not like the rest stopped and looked at the last group that's doing all the work. They're all right. If, if if yeah, if we take the parable just as, as as a casual parable, yes, we would look at it that way. But prophetically, when we compare it with Isaiah five, um, just prophetically, I like to kind of go in the direction of what we saw in Isaiah five. That look, when the workers stop doing work, the Lord departs from that vineyard and He sets up another, and that one is overtaken. So for the just just for the sake of prophetically looking at this, we're looking at it that way. But you're absolutely right. Just for the parable itself, yes, the workers continue. And even if all the workers would realize this is the last hour, you know, even those guys that started right in the beginning would think, oh my gosh. Right. Unless unless the first hour guys were so tired, you know, and it's the end of the day that maybe they took a nap for a little bit, you know, which is why there was a need for the eleventh hour because I got all these workers in there, but they're not doing anything. You know, but it's a good thought. Good thought. So you guys understand kind of what we're covering here? I mean, this is. Did you ever think that there's so much to Matthew 20, the parable of the vineyard? I mean, we can literally, you know, go through the entire Bible with this. Because Matthew 20 really is just a construct of the battle between good and evil and what the Lord wants us and needs us to do in it. It's really, really what it reveals. And again, I told you that I am. I was telling you at the time that. This group is the one that will produce fruit. Now that was me saying it, as I said it. Is it actually going to happen? Is there an indication in Matthew 20 that the fruit will be produced perfectly? Is there an indication, you know, explicitly in Matthew 20 saying, "Look, fruit's going to get produced." They did get paid. But does that mean that you know they were, they did their work 100% correct? But nothing stating explicitly is that look, everything that I wanted for, everything I wanted for to happen in the vineyard has happened. There's no indication of it. Just the fact that everyone received equal wages. When we go to Isaiah 5, is there an indication there that fruit will get produced? No, it's actually the opposite. It's almost like a little bit of a discouragement. Look, I set up this vineyard. It didn't want anything to do with me, or at least in the beginning it did, but then it didn't. So I need to step away from it and remove this hedge of protection and leave it to its business. A little bit of discouraging because, look, there's no more vineyard. But will the fruit be produced? I mean, this is a profound question. Well... The fruit be produced. Well, the 
fruit. Don't they have to be produced? I wouldn't pay them if they didn't produce. But look how loving he is. I mean, he's willing to pay those guys that work for only one hour, 12 hours wages. So these guys may not have been doing that great of a job, and he just took pity on them and gave them the money anyways because they needed to support their families. No, he said what is right. He said what is right. He didn't say, oh, I feel bad, but you guys are very... Mm -hmm. Good point. <laughs> That's how you answer what I just said. <laughs> the question still stands. Is there a clear indication? I mean, this can't be like... Yeah, there can't be a small implication that this is going to happen because this is a big deal. The destiny of the universe weighs on this. Whether Satan is right in keeping us in sin or whether God is right in bringing us from sin and saving us completely. So will the fruit be produced? How do we know? Because in Revelation, no? Yeah, but they didn't produce the fruit. They just picked it. God already yeah. produced the fruit. When you pick, you must be perfect. It must be perfect, right, but the, the fruit takes time to develop. As soon as, you remember, we every are day. not... Yes, yes, every single day. But is there any indication in the Bible that the fruit will be produced? I can think of one. Yeah, there, there's plenty. But I'm, I'm thinking, let's go to Zechariah chapter 8. There's a beautiful prophecy in there. We could go to the book of Chronicles where... David is singing there about the second coming, the return of the Lord, how the trees of righteousness will be singing to the Lord. Indication that, look, they will mature. But Zechariah 8, there's something absolutely beautiful there, something powerful that I think we need to take a look at. Zechariah chapter 8. Okay, um, Zechariah chapter 8, let's wait till everyone gets there. The first two verses we're going to look at is verses 9 and 10. The very, very end. It's right before Matthew, the last one. Like right before Malachi. Huh? We're not in those little ones enough. There's gems in there. We're about to check one out. Zechariah chapter 8. And can someone read for me verse 9 and 10 out loud, please? Thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong. You that have recently been hearing these words from the mouths of the prophets who were present when the foundation was laid for rebuilding of the temple, the house of the Lord of hosts. For before those days there were no wages for people or for animals, nor was there any safety from the foe for those who went out and came in. And I set them all against one another. Did you guys notice anything here? Some language that might be a uh... Somewhat similar. Ring a bell a little bit. Is that the wages or what? Notice in verse nine that this is remember this is a prophecy in relation to God's people to Israel. Uh, and the Lord is saying to his people, Let your hands be strong, you that hear in, in these days the words by the mouths of the prophets. Now the mouths the words spoken by the prophets, which prophets is it referring to? The prophets of, of ancient Israel. Right? The prophets at that time. And we know this is speaking of at that time that the foundation of the house of the Lord was supposed to be laid. God was supposed to establish for himself a people founded on the sanctuary, built on love and truth in order to be a witness to the world. Okay, That was the purpose in bringing Israel. And notice what he says. And think of, think of the parable of the vineyard here in verse 10. Because he now mentions the time prior to ancient Israel. Historically, look at this. For before these days, for before ancient Israel, there was no hire for man. Meaning that before ancient Israel, did the owner go out and look for laborers? No, he did not. So it's saying there was no hire for man, no hire for any beast, 
neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in. And I'm not sure if the other versions say this, but the King James says, there was no hire because of the affliction, meaning because of sin. because of sin, because of sin being in the world. That's what a fixture and affliction really means. And this is really just just a, a direct reference to what we studied in Matthew 20 about the owner going out to hire laborers. But before ancient Israel, God didn't call any group of people to form a corporate body. There was no hire. There was no work to be done within a vineyard. Because of sin, we know that this culminated with the flood, right? And it was shortly after the flood that then the Lord did, took steps to raise up for himself a people. Are you with me so far? Okay, now, verses 11 and 12. Can someone read for us, please? But now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. Notice something? So what's the answer? Yes. That's right. Will the fruit be produced? Yes. Perfect. And this really very much wraps up uh, how, how deep I'd like to go with Matthew 20. I mean, we spent four weeks on this already, and it's one parable. We kind of got to get forward. We still have a couple more on uh, a couple more weeks on 144,000. We're going to have to do Matthew 25. That parable, we'll do Zechariah 3. We'll have to go to Genesis, and uh, we've got a lot ahead of us, you know. But it's it's good stuff. It is good stuff. We need to be prepared and to understand this. <coughs> One thing I wanted to mention in regards to to this group, to this fruit being produced. Remember, how much fruit does the Lord need? Sorry. Uh huh. Specifically, is there a number? 144,000 that He's looking for. Okay. Now, what is the manner in which these grapes mature, meaning that let's say, let's say we're in the vineyard, and let's say it is the eleventh hour workers are there. They become part of the vine. The leaves are growing, flooding, and everything. Do you think that, let's say, the clock hits eleven fifty-five, and at that particular moment, all the grapes ripen at that exact same moment? No. So how does it happen? Which, how does it happen when it comes to, or Michelle, or? One at a time. Mm -hmm. They don't all, in the cluster of grapes, there are certain varieties that their whole cluster does mm -hmm. uh, ripen at once. But the, I think the older types, um, it was just one grape at a time. Mm -hmm. Right. And the more or less. Well, I know my grandmother grew grapes, and she said the variety she had, that the whole cluster would not grow, uh, ripen all at once. No. You would have to pick a couple off here and a couple right. off there. And we had the same thing when we had our, our little vine when we were still on the house over here in Yardley. We had the same thing, yeah. Some, especially some of the bigger ones that went out slow. A few right. would ripen a little bit quicker. However, here's a, here's a thought. If you see one ripening, what does it mean? What is an indication of? They're getting close to... The rest of them ripening, right? right? Most typically start slow, whole bunch at one time, and then intermediate. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in a, in a in a way that I guess is the easiest for us to understand as to how this is gonna happen. Because the fruit here manifests itself. You don't laugh. Manifests itself like popcorn. <laughs> Maybe a silly way to put it, but I think it's very straightforward. That when you put the popcorn in, I don't want to say the microwave. I, 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 no microwave. <laughs> but let's let's just assume you're putting the, uh, the the kernels in the microwave, the popcorn. What happens? 
you start. Right, once it reaches a certain temperature, you first start pop, 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 Boom, 144,000 all of a sudden out of the blue, wake up one morning, wow, what is going on? This is great. No, it's going to start with one. one or just a couple. Just like it started at the time of Pentecost. First, it was just 120, small group. Once they were ready, all over the place. And that's really what is going to happen up until that very last one fills the ranks. 144,000, okay, I got 139,999. The last one, bang. Once it's done, that's when we're ready to go. The Lord wins. Does this make sense? Okay, so I want you to think about this, even this idea of them manifesting themselves like popcorn and how they appear. It'll be a quick process, but it starts with a few, many, and completes, finishes off with the last remaining few. Um, I would like us to go go back with me to Matthew 20. Let's kind of put it put this into a, a bit of a broader context. Matthew 20. I want you to follow me carefully here. We're going to look at only verses 6 and 7, but don't read them yet. We've been looking at this parable as a prophecy, which means, again, that each group of workers represents a group of God's people in a different period of Earth's history, right? Which tells us that is there a place for us in this prophecy? Yeah. Yes, there is. Okay. So... Looking, because remember, the focus is 144,000. Looking at that, that last group of workers, looking at verses 6 and 7. Can someone read those two verses quick for us, please? And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath fired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Okay. Do you guys remember that little chart? Uh, not, not a chart, but a breakdown that we did of what we looked at in the trumpets and the seals. And we did the, uh, the review. I'll leave everyone here for that, not we? When we did Revelation 1 through 9 review, and we broke down those nine chapters. Um, chronologically as to what happens starting with you know, Revelation 1, 2, and all, and all of this. If you were to take Matthew chapter 20, verses 6 and 7, which describe the hiring of the 144,000 and their entrance into the vineyard, in this little timeline that we did here, when does that actually happen in real time, in the anti-type, in the future, in our time? Right, it has to be before that final warning is given because the workers have to be prepared and have to accept the message first right, before they can give it with power. Now, I just kind of want to go back into, you know, put it back into the perspective of what we looked at of the trumpets and the seals when it comes to the sanctuary. So if you were to take Matthew 20, 6 and 7, and to place it somewhere in here, where would you put it? Just so we put a context on what we've been studying so far. Remember, we looked at Revelation 1, 2, spoke of Jesus being in a holy place around 95 AD. By Revelation 3, he is in the most holy place. He is in the presence of the Father, and that was 1844. And we studied Revelation 8, Verses 2 through 4, how Jesus there is performing the work of the high priest on the day, on the anti-typical day of atonement. Right? He offers up the incense, and then the cloud goes up, 
and he goes in to sprinkle the blood. The saints are pleading for victory over self and sin. Right there. Right. There. right. Because the, the hiring of the laborers really is what? In Revelation 8. How is it exemplified? We were waiting in the marketplace for this bit of sort of like pleading for victory over self. Exactly. Because them being there for so long tells you that they wanted to. They wanted to work. So as we study this, it is God's people that at some point in time, and I believe it is right now, as we compare this with Isaiah 6, who are pleading for victory, they realize, look, the Lord is holy. This is what we have to do. We need victory over sin. We need to live a holy life. We need to be like Christ. And so they cry out for this victory in a way that they haven't done before. It really translates to what Pam just said, that them standing there in the marketplace saying, hire us. We want to do something. We want to glorify you and work for your honor. However, you can take that and know that no one's corporately hired them. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Exactly. Outwardly, they're not wanted. So if we could squeeze this in here. The pair, oh, in Matthew 20, verses 6 and 7, the beginning of that 11th hour, is what we studied in the beginning verses of Revelation 8, where the saints are pleading for victory. In response, Jesus sends the coals of fire from off the altar, just as it was the case with Isaiah, right? The seraphim comes in, puts the coal on his lips, and it represents a complete cleansing from sin. And then the Lord sends him out to spread the gospel with power. Same thing here. They stand idle. They are hired. Latter rain falls. Is the making up of the 144,000. Once the number is complete, all the final events take place. Because now God has a people who are ready. He now has fruit that is produced. Now, Peter, and when you read Zechariah there, mm -hmm. there was a word that jumped out at me. It's called Remnant. So that would be Which verse were you looking at? That last verse you read in um, Zechariah. Yes. So then, you want me to turn back early? Uh, the very end, right. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. That's the one, right? Yeah. So a remnant and 144,000 maybe the equal sign between the two. Mm -hmm. Oh, I believe so. I believe so. Yeah, I guess that's 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 a good point there. Did you guys catch all? Did all of you catch that? In Zechariah 8. In verse 12, at the very end, where it speaks about, and now it calls the remnant of this people to possess all these things. When we go on to Revelation, we know that the remnant there, of course, is the 144,000. The ones who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, right? Revelation 12, 17. But yeah, that's beautiful. Do you guys have any comments, questions? In the parable of the vineyard, in any way. I think we covered it pretty extensively. You guys understand the different groups of workers? Five sets. And again, the reason why we study this as a prophecy is so that we could put ourselves in this. This isn't just a parable to draw lessons of grace and of mercy from. This is a prophecy that tells us, look, there is a work for Peter Warden to do in this vineyard. And the work is not of minor importance. The, the work is of the greatest importance. It is a special work for which many are called, but you are chosen. Just like with the story of Gideon. If you want to be part of this special group, we need to get serious now because time is running out.
seems like time to plead for the Holy Spirit. Sorry? Seems like time to plead for the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's what we need. Yeah, I was just going to comment too. Is like we were talking about how like the hour is near from the perspective of of you know the work that the hundred forty four thousand or God's people. But you know, and you're kind of saying how like times have changed and it's harder now than it was. And it just it just with some reading that I've been doing lately, research that about how people's perceptions are developed and how like Can you speak up a little bit again? Yeah. How people's perceptions are like uh we're group that you know we're very influenced by group and mm -hmm. I was doing some research about this, all this psychology yeah. that's being put into like um, just all the technology that we have today and how like there's teams of psychologists that work on this to make things more addictive. I remember mm -hmm. you say something how Satan feels for our carnal cells. And he's really got his pyramid well built. I mean, it, with, with our technology, he's built this, it's coming very close to a world government or a world issue battle line it's in place. And that even if you're in Timbuktu now, you can be reached with a phone, you know, with one of right. cell phones. And one of the scholars that was writing an article about this said, you know, it is like 1984, because if you've told people in America, you will carry an RFID chip, and you will, so I can track you every minute, you will do this, and they wouldn't do it. But if you right. give them I, if you give them tunes they can play, if you give them other, like, you know, you can, they can text to their friends, mm -hmm. they'll do it by oh, And it's like, and that's all a psyop, that's all psychology. Mm -hmm. It's slick. And yeah. so a lot oh. of people don't realize how, how, how slick these people are. This yeah. is not Satan, Satan, it is that he works for people, and people think it's all about profit, and there's some sort of purity in profit. That's another big deception that you know, free market fundamentalism. It's this deception we've been deceived here. You know, people think that you know, if you're you know, you're conservative, you think with profit, everything is legit. Well, you know what? Somebody out gave you on that because it really, you're, you know what I mean? It's really scary. Right. And the average person has no idea. And of course, the school system does nothing to to encourage children, young children, to be guard guarded and be careful and to realize that everything they see and hear is meant to seduce them to buy something or to enter into some sort of dangerous behavior. And as a parent, it must really be difficult because no matter what you do with your kid at home or at church. They're seduced by these airwaves, the internet, the mm -hmm. phone, and everything else. Yeah, let, let alone the, the indoctrination in the curriculum in the schools nowadays. Yeah. And everything like you're saying. And bombarding with food. Yeah. The drugs. And it's a, as well as I can say, a total onslaught. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely great. Yeah. That's why parents have to spend more time with Okay. See, but the psychologists know. I mean, if you're a kid at age three, and I got them. That's why they're taking yeah. them younger and younger. We got to keep up. Education wise, we need them younger and younger. Yeah. And that's and why they get you know, young and they got them. Yeah, and that's why they did this feminist thing. And I was very much seduced by this. Is this idea of liberating yourself from? I think this is part of it. This may not be all of it. But many women my age and so forth thought, well, I have a career. And what that does is it pulls you out of the home. And then those kids are right in that game mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. and, they, and psychologists know that child, uh, there's a certain age they are in general where their loyalties are more to their caregiver than to the state. Mm -hmm. But if they yes. can get them yes. into that daycare system early enough, then they don't have the same loyalty to you as they do. Right. Is this a basic, like, Skinnerian psychology of behavior? You've, you've heard of Aaron and Russo, right? Yes. Aaron Russo, the, the filmmaker, the you know, before he died. Yeah, there's actually a clip on, on YouTube of him doing an interview. Um, I forget exactly where uh, before he died, but he was talking about his... Uh, you know, he used to be a friend of the Rockefellers and you know all the banking guys and whatnot, um, very close to them. And he was talking about a discussion or a conversation he had at one, at one point with, uh, with one, I think it was David Rockefeller at the time. And David Rockefeller asked him about, well, what do you think about, you know, the, the whole feminism movement, you know, in the oh. halfway through the century? 
you know, and he gave out, you know, the answers that you want him to give out, you know, freedom and, and equality and things like that. Um, and what you just said is exactly what David Rockefeller told him at that time. That look, no, the, the real purpose was twofold, at least to them, to the bank, to the bankers at that time, twofold. First and foremost, uh, the females that are at home that are taking care of the, that are taking care of the oh, house and the family, we can't tax half the population, which is not working. If you're working, you get taxed, we make money. At that same time, when the parent is out of the home, now the children are educated by what? By Dang. us. Yeah, by either the TV or the educational system that we provide instead of the parent relaying and instilling the morals in their minds and in their hearts. So over time, what eventually the result is you gain the country through gaining the education system. And if you you know, you look at you look at what what the system has done, what Satan has done in the last several hundred years, especially when it comes to the work of, of the Jesuits that we've been talking about, every single time the work has always started. If a country is to be undermined and destroyed and subverted, it always starts with the education. It happened in Poland. They always destroy the smart minds German. and overtake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always happens. But that's what they said. Yeah, that, that was the purpose of it. So now you break down the family unit, and we see what happened with Rome. The state owns a job. That feminism was invented by Stalin, 1930s. He, he was the pioneer preacher of feminism. Stalin. The women to work right away. Well, yeah, I have a <clears throat> no, but I was thinking about like once women did, stayed in the home, but na then they had a career. And I heard a young man from uh, Africa say, "He says it's really strange here in America." He says, "When I'm at home, people say, who is your family?' When you introduce yourself, mm -hmm. he says, here in the United States, they say, what is your job?'" You know, right. what is your career? Right. They don't ask who is your family. Right. How much do you make? Mm -hmm. No, but it was the idea that family was first, not their career. That's right. Yeah, I think that's the Western they society's kind of lost work. that. But one of my co-workers, that's, you know, she, she loves her children. And that's she, She'll tell you right away. If she could, she'd stay at home and just raise kids. But, she, you know, she loves just being a mother. So you can't. You can in the world that day. But yes, yes, you once, can. Once they right. got a lot of women out in the workforce, it's created enormous economic pressures now. It's really difficult for a lot of women. To say I that. disagree. I disagree. And the other thing I just want to make a point too about how I think Satan works is I think whenever there is prejudice and there is oppression, that becomes a site for disgruntled people, and I think that gets explored with unity. Like I think that women, I argue, I would argue that women, the feminist movement grew in part because there was room for it. There were many men that were treating women in ways that weren't so well right. good by that time. So it had it that those seeds fell on fertile ground mm -hmm. because there were women that said, yeah, yeah, you know what? I would like to go out and get a job. Like it goes back to show you if you live by the, the laws of God and you're treating other people decently, mm -hmm. whatever. And it's the same thing in other groups that are being oppressed. When you oppress people, then they get they want freedom from that mm -hmm. oppression, and it, it creates rebellion. Action and reaction. It's always like it that. is, and it, you know, it's yeah. it's that's the whole Hegelian dialectic. It really what it is. Is. But it's uh, again. So let's keep in mind that look, there's a work for us to do. The world is getting worse and worse. But look, we're not going to be here for long. You know, some of us I may know. actually be laid to I rest know. before others. You know, some of us are already resting, and you know, their next thought is going to be glory. We are going home. That's right. But there's a work to do, and it needs to get done. God needs to be glorified. Amen? Yeah. All right, so how about it? Let's this week, how about we start accepting those rays of light, start getting those leaves going. I don't think we're any close to, to budding yet. Those leaves need to come out first. And I'm speaking of myself first and foremost. All right, so let's keep praying for one another. Let's have a blessed week and live a righteous life. Amen? Amen. Someone close for us, please, with a word of prayer. Thank you. Let's go. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your protection. We praise your name and we thank you for just being with us everywhere and doing what we do. We ask the Lord to forgive us of our selfishness. We ask that you will pour your Holy Spirit upon us and bring us close to you and help us forsake the things that separate us from you so that we may share your love with others in your word. We pray that you will be with us today as we go home. Put your touches of angels around us and bring us there safely. 
and you can give us through the rest of this week and continue to grow closer and closer to thee. And thank you, Lord, God Almighty, for our assistance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.